presence of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just come before your word today. May we be still, Lord. May our minds be, may our hearts be open. May our minds be alert. May we never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Perfection. All right, so interesting, very interesting. As, as I was, well, this morning I've been told by two different people that the same topic of David has been shared by two different Christian broadcasters. Exactly. <laughs> and they get for a third time. <laughs> very good, a third time. Uh, very good. So, uh, the life and time. So, today I'm, I'm, I'm going to share particularly a story about loyalty. So, in this story, we have, we're going to have loyalty, loyalty, and jealousy, but also friendship. Uh, in this story uh, I'm going to share particularly about. So, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. David has just become a, a national hero. So he's just defeated Goliath, he's cut his head off, they've brought his head back to Jerusalem, and David was the, was the, one, that, was the one that led that, that, that attack. He, did. he was the one that did the, did the deed. Uh, so he's become, when you do something like that, especially in, 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 in ancient Israel at the time, you become quite a celebrity uh, when you do something like that. Real quick. Real quick. It's a very quick way to become famous. David, did you, have, you might, these days you might call it your 15 minutes of fame. He had more than his, it was definitely more than his 15 minutes of fame he was having right there at the moment. And so he's become a national hero. But this is also, but with every action comes a reaction. And who would this impact the most? Saul. Uh, this word. Saul never forgot Samuel's last words to him, the prophet, the prophet Samuel. When a prophet Samuel shares words such as that your throne will be taken away from you, I have rejected you by a man after my own heart, a humble man might get a bit worried uh, when you heard that from a prophet like Samuel. But Saul wasn't a humble man. And Saul wasn't a decent man. In fact, if he was a decent man, he wouldn't even be in this mess in the first place. He's in quite a mess, uh, Saul is at the moment. And everything pointed to David as his successor to the throne. Basically, when he was told his throne was going to be displaced, everything pointed to his successor emerging right there. So naturally, Saul would become more threatened. There are some very interesting moments in this story I want to draw your attention to. But first, I'm going to read from verse 1. If you just put the next slide up, thanks, Rita. I'm going to first draw your attention to this first part. It says, so Samuel 18, verse 1 to 4. After David finished talking with Saul, so Saul invited David to the palace to be rewarded for uh, defeating the giant. Jonathan, who is the son of David, became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow and his belt. So Jonathan, as I shared, is the son of Saul. And as you can see, quite a deep friendship was emerging here. So we see a beautiful friendship emerge between David and Jonathan. And this friendship between David and Jonathan starts to become more and more important uh, as the story progresses. We read in later chapters that Jonathan actually proves his loyalty to David in quite uh, significant ways. He did, especially in the most difficult times. What's incredible about the story was that Jonathan would have known that David posed a threat to his father's throne. Not only a threat to his throne, in doing so, his own personal line of succession uh, he did. Basically, David was a threat to his place in the line of succession. But here's the thing. It says here that Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. And because he loved him like himself, his interest to protect David was greater than his personal ambitions. It was. That's what it means to love someone like you love yourself. You love them so much that your will to keep them safe, protect them, to do what's best for them, becomes greater than your own personal ambitions. 
And that's, and that's how Jonathan loved David. And that's how we are expected to love our neighbours. To love our neighbours the same way Jonathan loved David. It says here. We are, loved to, we are called to, we are expected to treat each other with the exact same love. Treat others how we ourselves want to be treated. That's what it's all about. Treat others how we want to be treated. Jonathan treated David how he would have liked to have been treated. And how would Jonathan want to be treated who was in David's position? Well, with exact, well, with friendship, uh, with kindness, keeping him safe from your murderous father. You know, um, that's how I want. That's how I want to be treated if I was in David's position. And uh, Jonathan did exactly that. He kept him safe from even his own murderous father, protected him from his murderous father. You might say Jonathan was disloyal uh, to his father, but I don't think that's the point of the story. The point is to show how we are to treat others. To the detriment to ourselves. Now remember, the spirit had left Saul at this point. Remember, you have to think what we've... Try and remember everything we have read leading up to this point because everything in this, that we have read leading up to this point is hugely important. The fact the spirit had left Saul is very important. The spirit had left Saul. And here's the thing that might shock you and you might find controversial. The spirit had left Saul it had taken its root in David. Jonathan is not obligated to prioritise Saul over David. Sure, Saul might be his father, but remember, God had rejected him. God had rejected him and put his being into David. Preferred David. You are expected to love your God as your first priority. Jonathan is not obligated to protect his father over David. Because God had chosen David over his father. Jonathan was, in a way, being a good friend to David, but also being a godly man at the same time. He is being faithful to what, the God, to, to what God had wants to the detriment of himself and his own family. That is true faith right there. Uh, that is true faith right there. He's a great person to, to, to follow, Jonathan. In fact, to me, Jonathan will make a perfectly good king. To me, what I'm reading by the sounds of this, but that's not the point. The Lord had chosen David, and that was where the priority had to lie. And you see, the Spirit had left Saul completely due to his own choices. And you know what? Maybe Jonathan could see that David was a godly man, and therefore knew that the Lord was with him, and therefore goes where the spirit lies. You might say, the, the saying goes, you go in the direction of the breeze. Well, the breeze of the spirit was well and truly with David. And that's where the direction Jonathan went. And that's why this beautiful friendship was able to form. Which we later read later on as, as, as we see Saul try to kill David and Jonathan trying to protect him from his father. So the Lord was very clearly with David. It says here that David was successful in all that he did. He was given a high rank in Saul's army. And like it said, this pleased him. But we also see his popularity amongst the people. So not only was he popular, was he, had, he, had David found favour with God, he'd also found favour with the people. You see, too often we try and get popularity with people before we get popularity with God, not realising that if you get popularity with God, he will sort the rest out. <laughs> you do. If we try and do the right thing by God, we try and follow God and put himself first in our lives, he will sort the rest out, the desires of our heart. That's exactly what he did with David. David never sought popularity from people. He just wanted to follow God. Because he did that, he got these things that, you know, that... that that many of us crave in this world anyway, just because he followed uh, the Lord. So we see his popularity amongst the people. He found favour with God. And you see, because he found favour with God, he got favour with people. And we often get it wrong. Let's look for the... Let's seek first the kingdom of heaven and everything else will be added 
to us. It came because he put, David's popularity came because he put God first in everything he did. But also, and because he did that, people could see the love, peace, and the wisdom of God in him. They could see that in him because he had lived that way. He lived what he, what he, what he believed. Because he lived what he believed, he was full of the Spirit. What's the Spirit have? It has its love, its peace, but also its discerning, its wisdom that comes with the Holy Spirit. And David had all these things because he followed God. But then we see these words being sung. Let's just click the next slide. I'm, I'm next slide down through. I'm going to read 6 verse 7. So it's this the men. When the men were returning from battle, so remember, I just sort of read it in verse sort of 4 and 5. I talked about how Saul had given David a high rank in the army. They went to finish off the Philistines. And then, and then the men were returning from battle. When the men were returning from home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul. So they came to meet King Saul the king with singing and dancing, with joyful songs, with timbrels and lyres. So basically, you know, ancient tambourines and ancient guitars and ancient drums, those sorts of things. They came to meet them with. As they danced, they sung, Saul had slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. That did not go down well with Saul. <laughs> that did not go down well with him. That didn't. The people knew that David was more popular. With They knew who the real king should have been. They knew that David should be the real king and not Saul. Israel wasn't a democracy at the time, but I guarantee if Israel was a democracy, Saul would have been voted out of office uh, if, if, if it was at the time. He was the people's choice. Uh, he was. He was, um, he was the people's choice. The people knew David was more popular than Saul. But here's the best thing about the story. David did not let this go to his head. Can you just and click the next slide? Uh, thanks, Fred. Let's click the next slide. It said, David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. That's verse 14. 1 Samuel 18, verse 14. That's what I like about that. With great success, he kept the heart and the mind of a shepherd. He let other people's thinking change what he thought of himself. How many of us do that? Someone might say something positive or negative about us, and all of a sudden, our opinion of ourselves changes. You know, I'm guilty of it. I'm sure we've all been guilty of it over any time. Someone might say something, and you know, all of a sudden, what you thought of yourself suddenly changes. That's why our self esteem gets low, because we have a low opinion of ourselves, and someone might say something negative, and you might go, oh, you know what? They're right. And stuff, you know, I do talk too much, or you know, oh, I am greedy, or something, or oh, I stutter a bit when I speak, or oh, I've got a monobrow, or something. <laughs> if you know, you know. <laughs> you know, all these negative attributes, you know, some might say things about these things, or positive things, they might say, oh, you know, you know, about David. He does good sausages, they might say. Or, oh, you know about Geraldine, she's quite funny. You know, all these kind of things. And you might, or some might say these about yourself, all of a sudden you go, you know what, I am funny. Some might say these things about you, but you see, that's not good either. It's not good to change what opinion you have of yourself just because someone said it. It's not good to live by what people think about you either. And David didn't live that way. David didn't live by people's popularity. He didn't let what other people thought of him change what he thought of himself. Our opinions of ourselves can change because all of a sudden someone might say things like, <coughs> you know, they might say things like, uh, you know, David, you know, David, you know, Saul killed his thousands, but David killed his tens of thousands. You know, that could have, that could have let David go to his head, but he didn't let it go to his head. You know, David could have reacted incorrectly. He could have gone, yeah, you know what? I am better than Saul. I should be the king. You know? But David did not let people's opinion of him change him. He didn't let any other opinion of himself change himself. And you see, two things happen when that occurs. When someone gives you a positive opinion of yourself, 
or a negative opinion of yourself, two things change. You either let it, you either let your, you either let it, you either, you either let, you either become, you either let yourself think better of yourself and you go, yeah, you know what, I am this, I am that. It can allow your heart to become conceited if you allow other people's opinion of you to change the way you think of yourself, or you become negative about yourself. You see, I believe two things happen when you let your opinion of you, of, when you allow other people's opinion of you dictate who you are or dictate your opinion of yourself. You either become more prideful <coughs> of yourself or you become more negative of yourself. None of these things are good. You see, God's opinion of you doesn't change just because of what other people say about you. And that's how David acted. He didn't let other people's opinion of himself or other people's opinion of himself change who he was. He didn't allow that to change who he was. We either become full of ourselves or angry of ourselves. We should not let other people's thinking of us change what we think of ourselves. And that was another test of David. You see, David had never received this kind of affirmation before, either. How does David handle fame? How do we handle fame and popularity? How did David handle this? Too many celebrities don't handle popularity very well, especially when they're young. You know, Macaulay Culkin, Justin Bieber, two people that got hugely popular at such a young age. You know, they didn't let it handle, they didn't handle it very well. They let it go to their heads. David never had this kind of popularity before in his life. How would he have handled it? It was a test. He never received this kind of affirmation when he was looking after the sheep. The sheep never danced nor sung or sing songs praising him. It was the challenge of success that David also had to deal with. And many of us fall under the challenge of success. You know, I mentioned Macaulay Culkin and Justin Bieber and two people that have allowed success allow themselves to fall under the weight of success uh, they have. But because David was happy and he was content with the Lord when looking after the sheep, it meant he had the right heart to handle the praise that came his way. Because he had the right heart to handle the praise that came his way, the, the, the right heart to handle the little things, he had the right heart to handle the big things. That's why it's so important we have a good heart in the little things. Because if we don't have a good heart in the little things, then we won't have a good heart in the big things uh, that come our way. And David passed that test of success, which is why he was the man after God's own heart, which is why he was God's pick, because he didn't let popularity sway him, didn't let it sway him. And God knew that he wouldn't let people's opinions of him change what he knew God wanted him to do. You know, he didn't let the opinion polls, for example, change his policies as king. He didn't allow it. And he knew that, well, if David was going to change who, what he did, just because of what other people thought of him, he knew that when public opinion of him might change, he would do the right decision. Because ultimately, he would keep his heart right before God. Didn't always do it, I might add. He made mistakes, I should point out. But we know that but that was not who he is. Who he is, is who we are reading about in this story, uh, the person that he was. He had the right heart to handle praise that came his way. And we saw this last week when he got criticised by his brother. He didn't let that crush him. He kept his heart right before the Lord because his attitude was always to serve him and he knew that his reward was in him. So back to the singing that the women were giving him. This did go down well with Saul, and this made Saul very angry. And we should be surprised. We knew Saul was not in the right relationship with God, and all he had really was his popularity of the people. Saul was a very popular king. He was their choice to be king. He was. He was popular. <clears throat> but now he didn't even have that. You see, when we when we when we, when we are not in right relationship with God, we lose these things we hold dear. He likes to take these things away from us. God gives, he takes away. And now he had lost his popularity with the people. So to hear David being praised more than him really bothered him. 
It really, really bothered him. And as we read later on, he, it led him to a fit of rage. But we also see an example of what is a good leader compared to a bad leader. We see David completely unchanged by the popularity of others, and we see Saul becoming jealous because of the popularity that David had held. We should never be jealous because of a popularity, especially a subordinate. Remember, David, <laughs> rain's back. Remember, David and Saul were not in an equal relationship. David was his subordinate. He was. This was not. This, this was not an equal share of power. Saul was in a position of power over David. He was the king after all. But yet his subordinate was getting more popular than him. And as a result, he let that affect him because he wasn't in right relationship. And again, become, becoming jealous of a subordinate is the sign is not a sign of a good of a good leader. It is a poor attribute in a leader if you become jealous of a subordinate. A good leader should be proud when their subordinates become more popular than them. I believe they should, because it shows that they lead people well. It shows that they teach people well. It shows that they are putting people in positions of strength. Ultimately, a subordinate makes their leader look good. They do. They show, wow, what a great leader you are. Look at the people under you. Look how well they do, etc. But that was now Saul's problem. Saul's got jealous. He's more popular than me. How dare he? Who does he think he is? But again, Saul was in right relationship with God. This was driven by a guilty conscience. The prophet Samuel told him the Lord had rejected him. You know? If he was an honourable man, he would have stood down. But he was not an honourable man. He wouldn't have been in this mess to begin with if he'd been an honourable man. He wouldn't have had his throne taken from him if he had been an honourable man. So again, the difference between Saul and David. The difference is between a godly leader and an ungodly leader. So instead, he became significantly worried. And in the flesh, what does he do? He clings onto his throne. That's, that's all he could do in the flesh because he wasn't in right relationship. All he could do was cling onto his throne like a blanket, wondering when would God replace him. And this insecurity, born of guilt, also made him overreact to the praise of David. He could have gone, ah, oh, well, he's popular today, but you know what? I've been in politics a long time. Popularity can change just like that. It can. He could have thought, but no, he just let a fleeting second of popularity of, of David get the better of him. He did, and as a result, he made some terrible choices. So he began to hear, so basically, Saul looked at David with suspicious eyes. Everything he did, he did with suspicious, he looked at him with suspicious eyes, suspicious ears. He looked at David with suspicious eyes, and his mind was twisted with suspicion. What a horrible way to live. He became paranoid of David. This is the evil spirit that was on David. See, the evil spirit makes you paranoid. It does. From his own choices. And as a result, he became paranoid uh, with David. What a horrible way to live with suspicion and paranoia. That would be a horrible way to live. But he did that because he wasn't in right relationship with God. And then we see a climax to this the next day. Uh, next slide. Look at the next slide. Thanks. Read it. Verse 10 to 11. Is it the last one? Is it? Never mind. All right. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcibly upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while Dave was playing the lawyer, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Now we might say it was not Saul doing this, it was a distressing spirit. But Saul had the choice to respond. And he let his suspicions and his insecurities get the better of him. And he tried to kill David. He tried to kill David while he was being ministered to by David. Just imagine that. You've got, you've, you've got a worship leader. 
ministering to your soul. And instead, he tries to kill you with a spear. Ever felt unappreciated in ministry? Well, Dave would know how you feel if you felt unappreciated in ministry. Because here he is, ministering to David, to Saul, and he gets a spear chucked at him. <laughs> he didn't. But he escaped him. David escaped him from Saul. But did you notice that David didn't pick up the spear and throw it back at him? He'd have been within his right to throw it back at him. It's self-defense, after all, it would have been. He would have thrown it back. He could have said, well, life didn't scare me. You sure won't. And with a thrust of his spear, pin him to the wall. He could have done that. But he didn't. He just escaped. You know, no one would have blamed David if he struck back in self-defense. You know? I, I mean, for sure someone's killing you, trying to throw a spear at you. You have every right to throw the spear back at him. But that wasn't David's heart. David had a different heart. It wasn't what he could get away with. It was what God's heart wanted. That was the main thing. He knew that sorting out Saul was God's business. He was determined to let God take care of it and not seize the throne for himself. He would have known that he was the next king. He probably would have gone, all right, this is my chance. It's killing. This would have been. But no, this is God's business. Not David's business. It was God's business. This was. And he knew at the right time, God would put him as king. David says, Lord, I don't know, he didn't actually say this it's in the Bible, but, but, but we can imagine he would have said this, Lord, you put Saul on the throne. And I know I'm supposed to be the next king because you gave me your promise and your anointing. But getting Saul out of the way is your business. I won't touch it because he is an authority appointed by you. You start his reign, you have to end it. And what a great heart that was. And here's what's remarkable about, about the story. It says that Saul missed him twice. That means that David would have came back and played again. After having a spear thrown at him. Once you could say his submission, twice you could say his stupidity. You could have said this was. Yet he still did throw the spear back. After having a spear thrown at him twice. Once he could have gone, oh, jeez, someone tried to throw a jeez, he tried to throw a spear at me. Oh well, maybe he was target practice and I got in the way. Sorry, my bad, I'll just go back. He's chucked at me again. Oh, okay, maybe I better get out of the way here. Maybe I better get out of the way. Get out of the way. You know, then he could have thrown the spear back. And, he would, and you know what? He might have thrown the spear back. And maybe he still could have been king if he'd thrown the spear back. He might have thrown the spear back and speared Saul to the wall. And he might still would have been king. But he wouldn't have been the king God destined to be if he had done that. And that's what made him a man after God's own heart. Even in the face of danger, he stayed true to God and he stayed the path. He didn't let other people's opinions change him. He didn't let Saul throwing a spear at him change him. He stayed the path. And that's what truly made him a man after God's own heart and a, and a godly leader. How many of us would have done what David had done? You know, I certainly would have gone back there and played the, and played the liar after having a spear chucked at me. I'm not sure I would have thrown the spear back. I would have just ran for it. And eventually he did uh, run for it. After all, Saul was a powerful man. Might not have been a good idea to kill the king. You know, I don't know what, it's like, I don't know what it was like in ancient Israel, but if it's anything like, uh, you know, ancient Britain or Britain in the Middle Ages, there's a good chance you would have been hung, drawn and quartered. I would not like to be particularly hung, drawn, and caught it, so I'll probably run for it. <laughs> I probably would have done. But let's use this example. He was a man that would, submit, that would submit to the will of God. He submitted to his leaders. It's a good example, too, sometimes, when you look at the leadership around the world, around the country. Well, God begun this. It's up to God to decide when he will end it. It has. And, you know... We, we can only control the things we can control. And it's important that we let God control the things that only he can control. 
And that's our role is to submit to God. Our role is to control the things we can control and let God control the things that he can control. Amen. Lord, help us to control. As that, as that beautiful prayer, that strandy prayer teaches us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to grant us this, grant us the serenity, Lord, to accept the things that we cannot change, uh, Lord. Help us to accept the things that we cannot change, Lord. But the courage to change the things that we need to change, Lord, and the wisdom to know the difference. Help us, Lord, to know the wisdom, to have the wisdom, Lord, between knowing the difference between changing the things that we can change, uh, Lord, but also to accept the things uh, Lord, that we can't change. Accept the things that this is the will of God that we are in. It's up to the Lord to decide when things will come to an end. We don't tempt it. We don't manipulate it. He will decide when it comes to an end. Our job is to submit to him in all his ways. And Lord, help us to do that. It's always easier to do that sometimes, especially when we see you know, evil and injustice in the world, Lord. But Lord, it's up to us. There are sometimes you give us a leaning from the Holy Spirit to change certain situations, Lord. If that's our call, help us, give us the wisdom to know, uh, Lord. If it's not our call, give us the peace to accept it, uh, Lord. Help us to accept these things and the courage to make the change when we are called to make the change. Help us to be like David, uh, Lord, who stuck, stood true to God, didn't matter what people thought of him, didn't matter what Saul did to him. He stayed true to God and stayed true to the anointing on his life. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're just going to end in some... So there you have it. That is the word for today. And we don't want to end this time together without giving people a chance to accept Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, come into my life. I invite you, Lord, to your presence, Lord, to come into me and to move me like never before. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sin. I want to be born again. I want to be in right relationship with you. And I want to live with you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, you just got born again, make sure you get yourself to a good Bible-based church. If you happen to be in the Ocean Shores area, please come and say hello. We would love to uh, greet you and make you feel right at home. God bless.